good people, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're watching us from. This is the Wiser Woman Forum brought to you by Jane Favor. Jane Favor is a daughter of the Most High King. I am a wife, I am a mother, and by the grace of God, I'm also a minister of the good news. As always, I'm excited to be coming to you for the next few minutes to bring the wisdom that comes from the Word of God. I trust that you're well and that you're blessed and that this message has been transforming your life for the better because we started this message last year and God has been very particular about us taking our time because a lot of us have been struggling with understanding why we are here, why we are here for such a time as this. And the big question then becomes, if you tell me that I have a purpose, then tell me how I can get to know about that purpose. And that's what we've been doing. And it's been amazing. If in case you have not watched this series, I would highly encourage you to go back. The episodes are there for your viewing. You can go back, follow up, and catch up with us that we may move together. And I believe you shall be blessed. Share this program with a friend. And it's always a joy to hear your feedback about how this program is changing your life. Today, I know last time we said we shall not be talking about time. But upon reviewing what we talked about last time, I realized that there was a bridge missing. I told you that God exists outside of time. I told you that God does not work with our own clock. That God created time, but God created the watch. So it's, um, it's very likely that you might be feeling a bit overwhelmed because if he is outside, outside of your time, then how does he understand what you are going through? And now today I like to make that bridge so that we can move together and have that, have that bridge covered. Today I'd like to talk about the link between God and and yourself, the link between me and God in matters concerning time. Now, in case you've uh, listened to scholars of the word, you'll hear them talk of Kairos and Kronos. And in case you've never heard, it's simple. There is Kronos, which is the time of man. It's your daily time. It's your normal routine. It's your waking up, going to work, going back home, going to bed. It's you going to your place of work. It's you raising that child. Kronos is basically, you can say, it's like the boring part of life, the normal routine, the normal thing that you do naturally. Then there is the kairos. I like to think of kairos as the divine interruption. There is that voila moment. There is that you know, that that day that you never forget. You know, like in high school, we used to be told, write a composition about the so-and-so day, or even in right now, CBC, the best day of your life. Kairos is something that you don't forget because Kairos is when God now interrupts your time. It is the moment of encounter. It is the day of visitation. It is your day of manifestation. It is a, a significant moment that you cannot forget. But between Kairos and Kronos, you and I must first be faithful in the chronos and that means we must be faithful in the day to day so for a moment i want us to look at god and his chron his kairos because he exists outside of our time and we cannot limit him to our own clock we cannot ask we cannot manipulate him into coming into this particular you know the limitations that we have you and i i like to say that even if you're very blessed i i give you a hundred years because on top of what you already have and believe it or not when you speak to a very very old person you realize that death is actually something that they yearn for they keep saying that i'm waiting for the lord to come get me at 110 115 life gets very hard and they begin to yearn for god to come and take them home so even if i gave you a hundred years it will still not measure uh god's time because as far as you and are concerned before when jesus was last here or now that is two thousand years ago when you go way behind and you look at when the earth began how many people do you think have walked on this planet? How many souls do you think have departed and gone on to be with the Lord? They are countless. They are very numerous. In fact, if you thought about it, you'll see just how how insignificant a hundred years can seem in the face of eternity. But that does not mean that our time doesn't count. It actually means quite the opposite. It means that our time matters so much and is so precious because it's always ticking. Even this moment, the clock keeps ticking. It never stops to tick. What does that mean? It means now I'm bringing you to understand then who is God 
in my day? Who is God in my time? Does it matter really? And I need you to understand so that you don't feel like he has put you at a disadvantage. You say that I serve an eternal God and he's put me on a clock. He hasn't even told me how much time I have left. How am I supposed to, uh, put, to put my life in order if I don't even know how much time I have left? So we shall be looking at three things. We shall be looking at God, we shall be looking at man, and we shall be looking at the bridge that is time. So we start with the first scripture of today, and that is the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 5 from the message translation. And I'll read, just as you never understand the mystery of life forming in a pregnant woman, so you'll never understand the mystery at work in what God does. That is one of the things that you must make peace with. That just like you cannot explain how you are formed in your mother's womb or how your pregnant wife is, you know, that baby is being formed, the toes and the head, and you go for the ultrasound and you're being told there is a heartbeat and they can show you the toes. I just nod my head because surely I cannot even make them out. I just take them at their word. They say these are the toes. I say yes. They say it's a boy. You say yes. Because when you look at that muffled image on the ultrasound, you can't really understand it. The mystery is that you cannot really understand how God does what he does. It's so complex and it's so so vast that our natural minds cannot comprehend. That means you must make peace with that reality. I like to look at it this way. When you're standing on planet earth and you look up to the sun, the sun looks small. It looks so small. You might actually be, de you might delude yourself into thinking the earth is bigger than the sun. But the only reason it's so is because you're looking at it from where you stand and you're looking upward. You would be very surprised. The sun is so big. It is, uh, uh, its diameter, I believe, should be 109 times more than planet Earth. I mean, like it, it, it I don't even, they, they give an analogy that how many Earths can fit into the sun. It's that small. That we are so small in comparison to the sun. Yet when you look up, you think that the sun is so small. Why is it so? Because I am limited. When I am looking up, I can only see the sun from my point of view. Just like the earth. Until the first man went on the moon, we had never really known how the earth looked. But now we have images on Google. You can go and see how the earth looks from the moon. And you're able to see that it has, it, it, how beautiful it is. It has the blue and the clouds and all of that. And now you have that image. But before, man could only think of the earth as being flat. Man could only visualize as earth just being you know kenya by itself but now you have a better understanding because there's somebody who's gone higher to be able to give you a better report now our heavenly father is the maker of all things and that means he has the best understanding of every creation but for you to be able to comprehend that you need an eternity for you to understand every planet every galaxy every thing, every tiny living creature, every ocean creature, every walking creature on the earth, every person that will ever walk the face of the earth, you need an eternity. And we do not have that eternity. So first, make peace with the, that the workings of God are mysterious. And they are always going to be higher than our own thoughts. That his work is always going to be much bigger, much, much more broader than we can ever comprehend. Once you make peace with that, then you can move on to the next thing. Then if that be so, then why does God do what he does? Why does he make himself so mysterious that we cannot understand these things? And we go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29 from the message translation. God, our God, will take care of the hidden things. But the, re uh, but the revealed things are our business. Let me repeat that. God, our God, will take care of the hidden things. Remember, he is a mysterious God, but he's not asking you to supervise the rotation of the earth. He has not given you that assignment. He has not even asked you to make sure that the, the, uh, the, the, the sun itself is producing the right amount of gases so that there is no flares from the sun. He's not given you that task. He is not even giving you the task of, 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 of controlling, you know, when the sun rises or what the time it shall be in, in another continent from your continent. Actually, if I go further, he is not even giving you the job of breathing. He has programmed it naturally that you breathe. Otherwise, how do you survive when you're asleep? 
If it was your job to control how you breathe, how would you breathe when you are asleep? He has programmed that. That is a mystery. It cannot be explained. What happens when we are asleep? You are almost dead. But how come he watches over us and he wakes us up in the morning? He says, the things that are hidden from you, don't worry about those things. He talks about God, our God, will take care of the hidden things. But the things revealed are our business. It's up to us and it's our and our children to attend to all the terms of his revelation. So what does that mean in simplicity? He says, I understand that life is so broad that there is so much out there for you to be able to understand. And when you sit down and you try to understand as King Solomon would say, I went out and decided to research the wisdom and the folly of man. I decided to understand what it is, it is about life. And he went out on a quest. And what would happen to King Solomon if I'm to define it in today's terms, it's like the Solomon got into depression. Because the more wisdom he got, the more meaningless it seemed. The more he got, the more meaningless it seemed. So he decided wisdom is not enough for me. He decided to observe the ways of folly. And even the more folly he saw, the more depressed he would feel. He got everything, built the castles, got the women, had the ranches, had anything that he would desire, servants. He had a band that would entertain him. All in a conquest to try and conquer and understand this, this thing called life. And what was his conclusion? Meaningless. It's all meaningless. Because the minute you try to grasp what only God can grasp, then you're overwhelmed. You cannot comprehend it. You cannot understand it. And you begin to collapse under the pressure of what was supposed to be God's assignment, not your assignment. So this being said, what is this that has been revealed to us? We go back to the beginning. One of the things that has been revealed is that you and I were created for purpose, for a purpose, and not just any purpose, God's own purpose. That being said, what have we been talking about in the last few times? The many seasons that we've talked about this purpose, talking about overcoming uh, disposition. And by disposition, I was trying to show you about being out of position. Disposition means uh, a temperament, a, a, a character of somebody. But I use the word disposition to try and make it memorable. That is just being out of position. Grammatically, it's not what it means, but it's for memory, disposition. And I was talking about disappointment. I was talking about being let down by humans, by God, by your loved ones, by, you know, everything around you seems to be letting you down. Those were the things that are revealed to us, that have come to light to us. So we are accountable for what we know. We are enlightened by what we know. Another word for revelation is enlightenment, is lighting, that you're no longer in darkness, that you are now illuminated. You now have an idea. And whenever that light comes into your life, then you are accountable and responsible for what you do with that light. If you choose to ignore it, then you and your children will live in darkness, but not because there is no presence of light. It's because you have refused to accept and to embrace this light. So you now have to understand that as a human being, I am limited in comparison to the grand scale of our Lord. He has, he is so big. And as long as I am in this body, as long as I am walking this earth, I shall be limited. I'll give you a good example so that you don't feel small. Our Lord Jesus Christ is telling the disciples, why are you so downcast? Because I'm about to go home. Don't you know that it's for your own good that I go home? And what he was trying to say is this. As long as I am in this physical body that was crucified and that shall rise again, I will forever be limited. I must go to the Father. Then I will send you a helper who shall be able to be everywhere at any given time. Our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was God and also man, he was limited by this body. He could not be in different continents at the same time. He could not attend different seminars at the same time time. If you were to make appointments to see him, I don't even know what chaos would arise because it would be such a, a tedious process to get to go to, to, to Israel, to get to go down to Galilee and to make an appointment with him and all the crowd still waiting to see him. I mean, it would be a, a, such a difficult thing. So he had to go so that he could now enter his throne and now give us the ability to operate in dominion, though limited in flesh and blood, 
but still operating in dominion. Are you understanding what I mean by we are limited? It's just the, the way the earth has to function. Because outside of this body, you cannot function on planet earth. You need this body suit. And this body suit, hence, is limited. It's why you need to sleep after some time. It's why you need to eat. But God does not eat. He does not sleep. It's how he's able to make sure all things are running according to good order. And you must be okay with that. You must make peace with that. That when God is telling you that I do not exist in your time, he's not saying it out of, out of malice. He's not saying it out of showing you how small you are. He's saying it to help you understand and to come to terms with the reality that it's okay. And that what does not concern you, he will not burden you with. So that being said, what is this he's saying our revelation? What is this thing that he's saying that we are accountable for? In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29 says that you are responsible for something. Yes, he's taking care of the difficult things. He's the one who is always watching over your system. He has programmed your body. Ukikula chakula, it takes the nutrients and flashes, flashes out what it doesn't need. When, you, when you're traveling, he's the one watching over you that nothing will harm you until the last day because he is the one who knows how many days you have on earth you have no idea how many incidents or accidents he has set you apart from you have no idea how many dangers he could have safeguarded you from that is his mysterious doing and that is why we humble ourselves and we tell him lord we need you for what can we do outside of you but you are responsible for the revelation knowledge and for you to have a clear understanding of what this is we'll go to the book of Romans chapter 10 and verse 15. The previous verses before verse 15 is just simply how we come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we are told that it's easy to become born again. You just need to believe and you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart. And then it says that this was not enough. It's, enough, it's not enough for God to say that all should know him. All should come to him. That the only way for salvation is through our Lord Jesus Christ. We see something in the book of Romans chapter 10 that is so interesting. He says, but how can no, they know if they are not told? How can they hear if they, no one ever, ever, ever brought this message? So we look at that verse 15 so that we are able to understand what we are responsible for. And it says, and how will anyone go uh, and tell them, without being sent. What, what are they saying? To take this so-called good news, to tell you about salvation, how will you be told unless someone was sent? And this is something that is so controversial because some of you will tell me, no one ever told me, but I have news for you. The minute you clicked onto the Wiser Woman Forum, the revelation has already come. When you stand before the throne of mercy, you will not have the, the, to plead guilty. You, you, you will not have to plead innocent sorry. You will already be guilty because you chose to be rebellious, to not accept the good news. This is the news that we have been told. All of us shall have a chance. And the way we get a chance is somebody gets sent. And that is where the analogy of comes. How good are the feet that bring the good news? That is the scripture, Romans chapter 10, verse 15. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is what the scriptures mean when they say, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring the good news? The beautiful are the feet of those that bring the good news. And what is this good news? It's the revelation knowledge. It's the knowledge that you being told by God, you are in charge of you and your household. That is your business. That you must ensure that you and your household come to this revelation knowledge. One of these things is that for you to have internal life, you need Jesus Christ. And once you embrace Jesus Christ, he comes and he gives you eternal life. And you're no longer troubled by that which you cannot do, that which it does not concern you. You no longer have to put in the works to be born again and say, you know, I'm born again because I fast all day. I'm born again because I never eat. I'm born again because I read 30 scriptures a day. No, 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 no. Now you are set free by the knowledge that I'm not, so, I'm not born again because of the works I do. I am born again by grace, by believing in the finished work of the cross. I am born again. That is revelation knowledge. It was not known in the days of old, but today you and I have that knowledge. So as long as you're seated there and you've heard those words, when you go before the throne of mercy, you shall not tell Jesus that, oh Jesus, why didn't you come and tell me to get born again? You have already been told. Remember the story of the rich man who was telling Lazarus, please drop a 
drop of water for me. And then when he was told, no, 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 there is no way. There is no, there is no, con hakuna transportation ya mahali, niko na mahali uko. Then he pleaded and he said, please, at least allow me to send a message to my loved ones. Tafadhali ni ruhusu, ni wambie, so that they don't come where I am. So that they don't come to this place. It's a horrible place to be. And then what was he told? That even if I send someone right now, if they have not believed, they will not believe. That is how God operates. That what concerns you, he will make sure that you get the revelation knowledge. So every time I come and I say, receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it is put in the books of heaven that you had an opportunity to turn it around. But that day you hardened your heart. Every time another speaker comes, is there anyone in our midst who is not born again? And you are scrolling through what's up and you're thinking, today is not my day. I have like another five years. I mean, I'm still young. 20s, it's too early. And you're scrolling and you're thinking, hmm, hakuna mtu mwingine huku. It is credited in the book of heavens. Revelation knowledge came and you refused to embrace it. So as long as you have heard this news, it either becomes a blessing for you or a curse for you. So you have to decide what will you and your household do? Because this good news has come. God has worked on a vessel that they may come and sit here for the next few minutes and bring you this good news. I have done my part, but you're responsible for the other part. What shall you do about it? Will you be the one to say, not today? Will you be the one to say, I am too young for it? Will you be the one to say, I am too hip for it? Are you too rich for it? Oh, I hope you are not. Because in as much as we are serving a God who lives outside of time, whose majesty is so big that we can never comprehend, that even the 24 elders as they are worshiping him, they see so many dimensions of God that they never tire to worship him and they will never exhaust his many facets, his many, his many, his many dimensions, that you and I must first make peace with that. But we also must take the responsibility of knowing that there is a part that he has revealed to us and that is that you and I first have a purpose and to enter that purpose we need our Lord Jesus Christ and for our Lord Jesus to come into our hearts we first must believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths and for that to happen God must have already sent an angel for you and that brings me to the conclusion of today's message if God sent somebody to bring you the good news my question for you is are you doing the same for somebody who is still in darkness are you taking that good news to somebody who is still waiting for you to be the fish that will be beautiful as they take to them the good news? Or are you busy saying, Ay, mtu mwingine ataenda. Let us wait for a great evangelist to arise. Let us wait for an apostle. Let us wait for the end of the year when they shall go for the Kesha. Are you dismissing that you might be the good news, the one, the carrier of the good news? Are you sitting there thinking, oh, I am so happy to be born again. Look at how my life has changed. I am so thankful for God so thankful for my pastor. Had it not been for my pastor, can you imagine where I would be? I would still be dropping in the trenches out of being drunk. I would still be out there probably promiscuous out there not knowing that there's something better for me. And then you sit there and you say, oh, how wonderful you are, Jesus. How I love you. Are you that one? I have news for you. Revelation knowledge tells you that God is looking for people to send because there are people who need to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that means if if you know Jesus as Savior, it is your mandate to take that good news to that one who is still in darkness so that he and his house must might be saved. The story about Cornelius was, Cornelius was not really a Jew. He wasn't really of the bloodline of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't righteous as we would put it. But Cornelius is stated he was an upright man. That means uh, out of his, how, his heart, he was a good man. He put, he, he did all he could to the best of his ability to do good with his life. And out of that, God spoke to Peter who could not, Peter was so religious that he could not interact with the, with, with the Gentiles because of how he had been raised up. Any unclean thing, even touching, even, you know, he kept the letter of the law. And when Cornelius is 
is pleading to God and is offering these fragrant offerings unto God. And God is thinking salvation must come to his house today. Salvation must come. God had to intervene to Peter and tell Peter that I need you to partake that which I've cleansed. And first he sees a vision of these unclean things. And Peter is like, I have never taken anything unclean in my entire life. But that was not the case. God said, that which I have cleansed is clean. So, if you're being sent out, if you're the Peter today, please arise and obey. Go out today. Be the feet that brings the good news so that another might walk in revelation knowledge and we can quicken the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because when all shall hear the good news, guess what? Then the end shall come. That is your mandate and it is my mandate to go out there and to share this revelation knowledge. You are responsible for the light you have received. You must light your light up. You might put it on a uyeke mahali ju iangaze for all to see and that means one of the things that you do that is share the good news please 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 if you're not born again today is your day confess you with your mouth and believe in your heart that jesus is lord and you shall be saved and if you are already born again it is your mandate to take to the news to that person and tell them about the good news that we may all walk in revelation knowledge and that we might move together in unity towards the destiny that god has for us eternity is unto god for you you are within time do what you can with what you have. And I believe you shall be immensely blessed. Glory be to God. Be blessed. And shalom.